Cause see, I kind of finished writing this song, Sue Jet, about my mom. And it's gonna be like, you know, 50s. And I want the bass, basic thing to be the piano. Doing like a boogie woogie thing. somebody that knows how to do that.
that's it, because I want to play with the stereo mic. I think it'll sound better. But I gotta get this song right. Sujet. That's my mom's name. Like Joan Jett with two T's. My mom was named that in 1942. Sujet. Then her maiden name. I mean, when she was young, she was crazy. That's why she was totally into what I was doing. She had like purple hair and almost like a mohawk and high heels and she caused quite a commotion and caught the attention of three redneck brothers from West Virginia. It's a perfect story. Walking down the street looking so neat. Sue Jet, Sue Jet. He's got the eyes of three redneck guys. Sue Jet, Sue Jet. And gets in his 57. Turns the car on. Puts her pedal to the metal and smacks it into a wall. Sue Jet, Sue Jet. That's true. He got my mom and my dad's 57 Chevy. Turned it on. Didn't know what stick was. Put it in something and floored it. Bam! Smacked it into a friggin' fireplace. The wall sounds better. And then there's another time they're cruising up in Angeles, up, up in the mountains. So my dad now had to get another car, so he got a Corvair. So Sue Jet, Sue Jet, driving with her man up in the mountains. Sue Jet, Sue Jet. She asked, What's that tire going past her car? Sue Jet. <laughs> and then her man goes, Hey, that's my back tire. And she goes, what do we do? See, it's a whole song and he needs to be put together. So back tire passes him. My dad freaks out. She slams on the brakes. The tire hits, goes over the side, down thousands of feet, no tire. And they had to wait for somebody to come up and get him, put a tire on. Their Corvair, which was, look that up. That guy, uh, idiot, guy, had him banned because they were unsafe. Every car was unsafe. They didn't have seatbelts back then. Jeez. So I love having old, you know, cars. You don't need seatbelts. They didn't come with them. You don't need them.
probably sound like crap, but... So, I hope you're checking out these documentaries. Now, this near-death one, the first one that was a minute, perfect hook, perfect everything. That's what I want it to be about. The second one, and it's not the guy's fault that's making it, it's just, and you can believe whatever you want. But as soon as we started talking about, you know who, SAT, as soon as, I, you know, and you can think, oh, it's a big joke and all that horse crap. Look it. The pick thing, who knows? It happened. The pick's still in the ceiling. Did it happen to Nikki? I don't know. I never saw a pick in his ceiling in his apartment. And then I wasn't that. I was in his apartment maybe once, maybe twice. No pick, probably put to get it down. I didn't take it down until it's still, it's still up there till this day. It was my room, and then I, when I moved out, my mom moved in. She's never even noticed the pick. Never. I took a picture of it after she was gone, so she never saw that pick. And I didn't want her to. I didn't think it was an evil. It's things are what you give it. That's why I said, okay, if we're gonna do that whole thing with the star and the candles, I told Tony, you're doing the whatever you're gonna say. And he said what he said, we went back in and we busted out all those songs. Well, we busted out half the songs in one night and the next half, the next night. And the first song we wrote all the way through without stopping was Trick or Treat. Lyrics and music, boom. And that's after almost two weeks of sitting there and we couldn't come up with nothing. So you're telling me, so I, we just went out there, shh, he did his thing, and that just, you know, it all fell together. And it just happened to be that our first gig was on, you know, March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, which guarantees us a crowd. And it just so happens that Tom Mastery is doing her rock to the top thing. I'm not mentioning the camera guy because he's a jerk. And you owe me. You owe me, Carpus. So anyways, uh... You know, so that happens. And then that takes off. Now we're booked for six months. But the next gig, so that was on a Tuesday. That Friday, we're playing the, our next gig. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we're going down to Joshua's. They filmed us, trying to get that tape. It's an incredible show because after this third song, the idiot drummer triggered, well, he's not an idiot, he didn't know. He triggered the uh, smoke bomb. And it's supposed to be an indoor smoke bomb, so it dissipates. It was an outdoor smoke bomb, so it cleared the entire club. And we're like, you know, we didn't want to show that we were blowing it, but we couldn't see each other. I couldn't see my hand like this, and we're playing the third song, and it's just a mess, and running into people. But everybody was like, because the song before, you know, Mandy grabs Tony's head back, and he's on his knees playing bass, and then Mandy does something, I don't know, and blood starts pouring out of... Uh, Tony's mouth. We had a great show, and this is all just fell together. We didn't like, write it down, like, let's do this, let's do that. It just happened. So then after that, we find out Troubadour wants us back the next week to uh, play with uh, Michelangelo Petillo. But we are not opening. And I'm like, what? So we sold out. Everybody I ever went to school with was there, and they all said it was great. They couldn't believe it, and I couldn't believe it. So we went from that, we did one more show, and then Capital came to me, because I was the one in charge of everything, and they said, look, we want to do a private showcase. And we already did a showcase just for the man a manager. Uh, but it was, you know, down at Audible recording, and it was great. Uh, everybody just said, oh my gosh, I don't know what you guys did, but this is an amazing band, and you know, it was a full dress rehearsal. So, after that, Second time, so this is a month later, we're doing a showcase at Audible in the second size room, which is still pretty big. It's about as big as Starwood. So we're sitting there, ready, all set up. They got everything ready to record a stereo, you know, of all the songs. Stereo recording, set up, ready to go. Singer's gone. He freaked out. He just, he didn't know what to do. He freaked out. He never showed up. We had a $1.5 million contract. 
Let that sink into your into your head. Not like Wasp, one. Not like most people, one. One point five million dollar contract. Which doesn't mean that here's 1.5 million have fun party away like some people in Guns N' Roses thought. That means you take that money, if you need to get somewhere to live, do it. You need to use it to record. You need to use it to get your stage together. So when you go out on tour, and then you know they'll set up stuff and they'll help out as you're touring. But you're using that money to get yourself out there. You have to pay it back. You're supposed to pay it back. So the singer never showed up. And then his next band, same thing happened. He bailed again. Done. Third time it happened, the uh, record company that signed the singer was like, okay, we're going to you know, have a guy live with him. We'll give him a little bit of money to, so he makes him feel special. And they built the band around him, you know, Jimmy Bain, Vinnie Apice, and Tracy G, who went on to be in Dio again. And they wouldn't let him go. He couldn't escape. So they get him opening slot on Iron Maiden tour, and he, you know, if you ask Mandy, Tracy blew it. If you ask Tracy, Mandy blew it. If you ask the drummer, Vinnie, he was throwing sticks at both of them. So I don't know who froze, who did what, I don't know. But that guy has had so many chances. He's had more chances than anybody I know at huge success. And he was getting that Iron Maiden tour in 92. So he would have been opening for him the whole North American tour in 92. And they made it two shows and bye bye. And you didn't hear from that guy again for over 10 years until he came back and, you know, tried to get something together, and we did something, me and him, me and, me and him recorded, him and uh, Jakey Lee recorded, I said, stop wasting your time with that guy, and Jakey Lee heard me, he's like, who's that guy? I said, somebody that's better than you can kick your behind, and so Jakey's all, I'm coming up, man, I go, bring your car, you see, you got a, hot, a fast car, he's like, yeah, I got a Chevelle or something. I go, dude, I got an AMC, AMX, I'll blow your doors off. So not only am I going to kick your butt, I'm going to beat you in drag racing. So that's a quick story about all that. And uh, there you go. So tomorrow, hopefully, I'll be able to come up tomorrow night and get that uh, Sioux Jet down a little better. Maybe. Maybe tomorrow, maybe the next night. Depends on what's happening because I'm trying to get that one documentary done, the other documentary started and then get trick or treat live and fail attraction best of stuff you haven't heard put out so you guys can have it and then hopefully by the end of the year the end of the this year or the very beginning of next year my stuff will be done it all depends on the singer really i can they're ready to go all the songs are written they just got to be finished up and he's like well what he, he won't work with a demo that's what demos are for he wants it clean, Paul. He's got to get his thing. He's got to get into his head that this is a demo. So get your voice on there. If it's good and we can use it later, we will use it later. If it's not, then you got to do it again. Just do it, though. Don't just sit there and make excuses. Right? 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 Am I right? I'm right. Of course I'm right. Because I'm Michael D. Rock Legend. Everybody have fun. Try to laugh and uh, blow everything off that you don't know what to handle. All right, all right, all right. Okay. See you later, man. Rock on roll. Rock and roll, Metal.